Haven, can you not eat a plastic bag? Please, please. Don't stop eating me. Come on. Come on. We will play later. <laughs> I don't know what you are. You're not a cat. Okay. I don't even know. I don't even know where you got that. All right. Let's talk about my favorite non-straw hat pirates, ironically, while wearing a straw hat. The first, to no one's surprise, is my beloved Whitebeard. I love him so very much. I absolutely adore the found family trope. So being able to take in all these pirates, calling them his sons, how much he loves and cares for this, them, how much he would, the war he would start to make a good future for them and see them safe. I love Whitebeard more than anything. Part of that is going to be in relationship to how we see his, him through Ace. Just because like Ace calling out to him saying, Pops, you're here, this is my fault, all that kind of stuff there. Beautiful. But knowing that Ace had tried to kill him in the past and Whitebeard had gained his respect and now he calls him Pops. Whitebeard is my father. He rejects his blood relative and is just like, no, this is the family I have chosen. The, the crew is my family. I am obsessed with everything concerning Whitebeard and the Whitebeard Pirates. We'll go to my grave loving this man. Uh, the next would be, none of these are in order after Whitebeard. Whitebeard's number one, everyone else is just vaguely somewhere floating around number two. So we have Oris the Junior, the, the giant in Whitebeard's crew. This, I'm not going to name every single character in Whitebeard's crew. I could, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to name a few of them now. Uh... Seeing him, seeing Ace make the hat for him and him charging through the battlefield to get to Ace saying, do not call me back. I need to get to Ace. I will plow us a, a path. You guys follow behind me and I will take every hit to get to Ace. Because the hats that he had of friendship, I believe they had might have mentioned made from learn to make it or this is how they wear it in Wano. I, I'm not that far into the series yet. But um, saying you're so big, you're close to the sun, you need to be protected from the rain. Those panels of Ace making the hat and saying like I kept burning it, but eventually I got it right. And him and Orson in the rain. And say, no, I'm good. I'm protected. I have my hat. Ace made it for me. I love this man who gave his life trying to get to his brother. And I I am obsessed. I love the White Beard crew so very much. Sticking with the same arc, because if it's not clear, that arc affected me heavily. We have Mr. Three, and slightly before it as well also affected me. But seeing him um, make his sacrifices and do something reckless because of what he felt towards Bon Clay and to do it for a friend and honor a friend's memory, not letting it go to waste. I love Mr. Three, standout character. Uh, same thing even in uh, Impel Down where he's like helping Luffy and his relationship with Buggy. It's all been fantastic. Mr. Three did not expect to love this man when he was first introduced. Was it Drum Island, I think? I'm not 100% sure. But yes, I love this man. Can't wait to see more of him. Uh, while we're talking about him, Bon Clay. Does, does that need to be said? I love Bon Clay. Once again, power of friendship. I love his face switching abilities. I love how he goes from enemy to friend. I love that he calls Luffy Straw Boy. I lo love how much he wants to protect and help the Straw Hats because you're my friends now. Uh, sacrificing himself so Ace, uh, they can get to Ace to try to save him. Bon Clay. A plus. Love Bon Clay. I've already mentioned Buggy, but Buggy, again, I did not expect it because when we were first introduced to Buggy, meant nothing to me. He was really annoying. Didn't really like him as a character when we were first introduced. Now, the cult of, Bu the cult of Buggy has is just fantastic. The way he's continuously, as the comments have rightfully put it, is falling upwards and how he just keeps succeeding and succeeding and taking credit for things. And he's got this backstory. Like, his pedigree is fantastic. Like, sailed with the Pirate King, uh, trained with Ace during their apprenticeship, and now has all these connections and has been in all these important battles and has never been caught. Like, yes, no, 
buggy if if luffy does not become pirate king somehow it's going to be buggy and i don't i don't want to luffy has to be the king of the pirates but a top contender is going to be buggy somehow he's going to make himself be a front runner for that title and it's going to be hilarious i gotta mention kobe and helmeppo i and Garp. I gotta mention Garp too. I know I've said that I I hate Garp. Like he's on my two kill list. Like I want to see you die because of how, uh, what happened with Ace and anyone involved. Technically he's on hold. I'm waiting for Luffy to forgive him or at least acknowledge what's happened. So technically he's on hold on my hit list. But he's still technically on it. Um, that is not because he isn't the a very well written character and the emotional depth and what he is going through, having to choose between his own found family and the Marines and his respect and holding up the ideals that the citizens have in him and the responsibilities he has versus his own family and his grandsons. Putting those in conflict, allowing himself to take that hit from uh, Luffy that knocks him off, allowing Luffy to get to Ace. And, um, oh, how he was going to kill Magma Bastard if uh, Sengoku had allowed him to get up. Yes, I love Garp's character. And I really like his right. I don't want to say I like him because I'm angry at him. I'm so angry. I do think if Ace had said, save me, Grandpa, I think Garp would have cracked. But I... Ace wouldn't do that. He made his choices and he was following his choices through. Mm, I want to love and hate. I hate, I love and hate Garp in equal amounts. He's staying on my list till Luffy forgives him. And then Kobe, seeing him go from crybaby to Marine, I'm so excited to see where he's going and what he's going to be. And the same thing with Helmetbo. Those little cover stories really got me invested in them just because seeing their growth from spoiled brat to competent marine i want to see them both end up using hockey i'm just very excited to see more from them in the series i haven't officially said ace so we're just going to say ace now because i loved ace so very much and i am so sad that oda had me grieve this man emotionally traumatize me uh first as luffy's brother like that it hit hard, but I wasn't grieving him as a character because I didn't really know too much of him. I loved him as a member of Whitebeard's crew because I love Whitebeard. Um, and I loved him as Luffy's brother because I love Monkey D. Luffy. I love that man so very much. But then in the post-war arcs and we get to see him and his personality and his protectiveness and what he went through to protect Luffy on leashing hockey at such a young age and fighting the bandits and being so angry and violent all the time but insecure and feeling he isn't worth living and what is his what should his life be and people want him dead and all he wants is acceptance so when luffy says i'd re I, I want friends i don't want to be alone anymore i was in tears then oda had the nerve to make me grieve this man as a character in his own right after i just grieved his death in the previous arc for his relationships to everyone else Oh god, Ace is a well-written character. I would not change a single thing about his story. I mean, if I was changing it, I'd probably sacrifice some of the emotional heartbreak to make him- No, that's a lie. I like the emotional heartbreak. Um, Crocodile is next. I hated this man so very much because of my absolute love for Vivi and Alabasta, and Alabasta was the arc that got me invested in One Piece. Uh, until, like, the halfway point of Alabasta, I was just like, this is an okay series. I'm, I could take it or leave it. Alabasta changed it forever for me. Loved it so very much. Uh, and he was the main villain. And I despised him. He was terrible. He was destroying the home of the people I love. And he was hurting Luffy. But then, but then, we get him out of the prison and impel down. We bring him to Marine Fort and he saves the day, like knocking the executioners off the platform, saving Ace the first time. Saving Luffy another time is just like, don't make uh, any assumptions. I'm not on their side, but I'm certainly not on your side, Marines. I'm just going to see to it that you guys don't win. And then when he's protecting Luffy, it's just like, if we're doing this, let's do this right. I am so excited to see more from Crocodile. All right, finally moving out of the uh, Marine Fort characters a little bit. Uh, let's talk about La, because actually he was still in Marine Fort. He showed up at the end to save my sweet darling boy, Monkey D. Luffy. I love this man. I already swore to love him forever for that moment alone. But then he continued to impress me 
first from his strategies and his planning and his backup plans, but also how much he loves his crew and how much his crew loves him and how done he is with the Straw Hats and Luffy's antics and just being like, can you take anything seriously? The face that man made when they strapped Chopper to his head is just like, I'm regretting ever making the these deals with you in this alliance. It was wonderful. And then to get his backstory and everything with his home and seeing how far he's come from this little boy who's lost everything and just wanted death and destruction of the world and to kill as many people as he can before his own death to come so far. And now he's a doctor in his own right. Now he's got his own family to protect and he just wants to take revenge on uh, Doflamingo for what he did to his family. Uh, that's going to lead me to the next one on this list, which is um, Corazon or Rosinate, I believe. Don Quixote or Ros Ros Rosinate. Love this man with all my heart and soul. Um, seeing him be this cranky old man that hates kids only to realize that he is, um, pushing the children out of, uh, Doflamingo's, like, army to keep them safe. Uh, the way he treated La and then, but kept his secret about the Will of D. They keep, not, not even the Will of D, but the, uh, how he stabbed him at first. La stabbed him, so he kept that secret. So later on, uh, La kept his secret and he's sworn to save La's life. He will travel through all the hospitals. He will fight doctors who are treating him poorly and don't understand the condition and it's just going to stereotypes. His power of the silence fruit, which pairs so well with how clumsy he is because he needs to be silent to accomplish his missions. So, because he's going to be banging into things and how well it works in a infiltration kind of mission. And seeing him take the the shots to get uh, La that devil fruit and just wanting La to be free and unable to kill his own brother. Oh my God, I didn't even talk about his own backstory with his family and the leaving the Celestial Dragons and going into first not poverty, but then being more or less crucified in, and then going into poverty and his own brother's a psychopath. Like this man's had a rough life. Uh, and then, and then, and then being taken in by the Marines and raised like the, as a grandson or child by Sengoku, of all people. And then, and then the conversation with La saying it had nothing to do with the Will of D. Don't try to look for reasons for why someone loved you. This man was wonderful. So wonderful. And I love him. Very briefly, I will also say, uh, Doflamingo is a favorite character in terms of I appreciate his writing because that is a good psych psychopath, sociopath, something. Uh, so just well written, particularly because of how he treats the executives and his family. So I maintain, I don't think he actually is capable of love. So I don't think he loves his family, but he wants to. He likes the idea of a loving family. He's willing to sacrifice them. There's like a limit to how much he will care for them. But he will protect them against people insulting them. I think personally it's just because they are extension of himself. And a threat to them is an attack against him. But I also think he craves and wants recognition and appreciation. And he wants to be not appreciated and loved, but... Not worshipped, maybe worshipped. He does want to be like celestial dragons view themselves as gods, and he wants to be king. But like he, he, they hype him up a lot. They say how generous he is. They say how kind he is, and he wants that opinion of him to be true, kind of thing. But he also wants to be the puppet master, controlling all the strings and in control and manipulating events so he gets what he wants. He is just a very well written character. And part of that is just how he's written around his family. And still hate him. Be, like he is A plus top tier, S tier villain. Just well written and makes a presence. So I, he's on this list, but this list is not just my favorite characters because I love them. This is also just well written villains, apparently. Uh, while we're on it, let's talk about Bellamy because I'm just a appreciating him in general and what is going to become of him and his story. I'm very excited for his story because we've went from this man insulting Monkey D. Luffy like an idiot, uh, bashing his dreams like an idiot, only to realize that you can go to Sky Islands and he goes there. 
he has no dream himself. He's worshiping and respecting Doflamingo. Like he's chosen a person to follow rather than a dream, which is a direct conflict to Luffy. And then when he realizes that Doflamingo is not someone worth following and he realizes he picked the wrong person, like he should have picked Luffy or at least someone like Luffy, he doubles down and continues to see his choice through to the end, which personally, I would have just switched teams. But it's a very interesting character that I would not have even thought of. So I love it being like in for a penny in, or in for a pinch in for a pound. That character is incredible. And now that everything has wrapped up, he was just like, I was willing to die by the hands of someone honorable like Luffy. But now that I'm still alive, I'm not going to die by the Marines. So I'm going to go off. I'm going to take the life card thing from Luffy, but I'm not joining the Straw Hat fleet. I'm going to find my own path. But I'm keeping my options open. So I'm very, very, very excited to see what happens with Bellamy. Uh, next is Viola. The beautiful girl she is. I love her powers so very much. I love how much it works with the Straw Hat's the powers. I loved her relationship with Straw, uh, with Sanji. Uh, I, she was just crazy enough. She, she's a princess. She sacrificed herself to protect her father. I, I really, really, really love Viola. Like, more than I probably should. Like, I want, I'm so, I might be more upset by the fact that she didn't join the Straw Hat crew than I was when Vivi didn't join the Straw Hat crew. And that is really saying something. We'll get to Vivi. But... I, I don't know what it was about her. I really think it was the pairing. I loved her time with Sanji, however brief it was. I loved how much her sight powers worked with Usopp's uh, sniper skills. But and now that he's getting observational hockey, it's probably not needed. But still, I love that moment. And I just really want more from her. And I don't think I'm going to get it, which is very upsetting. Uh, next is Bartolomeo. Uh, because he is me. He is me. He is gushing and loving the Straw Hats. Leader of the fan club. Got a boat that looks like Luffy. And he is wonderful. He's saying, yes, Miss Robin, make me your slave. I mean, let me protect you. I mean, you can protect yourself. Can I help? Let me put a barrier up so no one can touch you. Uh, same thing. Just gushing over Zoro. Like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I love this man. This man is me. And he is strong as hell. He's a lot stronger than I would be in the One Piece world. I love the barrier power. I love how he can also put it around his fist to make a punch stronger. I just, I really, really, really love this man. Okay, now we can talk about Vivi and the duck. Is it Karu? So that duck is adorable. That duck is hilarious. And in com combination with the, the Strong World movie, I need the Straw Hats to get a duck. Specifically, I would prefer one with lightning powers. But uh, I want a duck to join the crew. If it can be Vivi's duck, Karu, I really think it's Karu. I, think, I just apologize. We've established I'm bad with names. But if he can join the, the crew, I, I would love that. And I'll, obviously, Vivi needs to join the crew as well. She is a straw hat. She's just not on with the straw hat. So I don't know if I should really even count her. But she, you get the point. Vivi is wonderful. The way she sacrificed everything to go hunt for those threatening her kingdom. The uprising. Putting herself at danger. Her running into a stampeding army. Begging to for them to stop. And screaming at them to be hurt trying to be her but it can't be heard under the chaos and everything that was going on around her and then finally finally when she gets to the point that she's in a position to be he heard um the explosions the sacrifice almost sacrifice of one of her closest friends and guards it was a heartbreaking moment and then when that rain came down and she could finally finally be heard and her voice reach her people it was emotional. This was the moment that got me completely hooked. And I'm like, I'm in for the long haul. After this moment, nothing is going to stop me from finishing that series. Vivi and Alabasta in that moment, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I am completely in. And even going forward now, seeing her once again setting sail and with her family out at sea, it's like, it's where she should be. I can't wait for her to reunite with the Straw Hats because she has to. All right, I'm probably going to say this name wrong, but Toto, I think it was, uh, the, the guy from Alabasta who was digging the hole, looking for that spring to bring back the life of his home in the village of Alabasta 
and the respect and trust he had in his king that no this has been misunderstanding misunderstanding the king is a good man he would not betray his people he would not do this to us he is not the cause of this drought and just how he continued to dig and dig and dig when everyone else has given up and then when he finally finally got that little bit of water and was able to give some of that to Luffy to fight on against Crocodile that man and his faith and loyalty to his king and the trust he had was absolutely excellent. All right, we're working backwards a little bit. We're going with Gein and uh, him with his relationship, uh, however brief, with Sanji. I want to see this man back. So Sanji found him like starving to death, unable to pay for the food when he came to his restaurant. And it's just like, I'm not seeing someone starve. So he gave him food. And then he returned with uh, his captain, who's terror on the Grand Line, gave him food to their starving crew, coming back to attack. And then Gein has his loyalty to, honestly, I, I used to know what the captain's name was, but it doesn't matter right now because I'm talking about Gein. I hope I'm saying his name halfway right. But that man and his loyalty, his conflicting loyalty, because he refused to fight Sanji or to at least kill Sanji on his captain's orders. Like, I can't kill the man. Who saved us? I can't do that. I respect you, Captain, but I like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then the Captain betrays him, uh, only for Sanji to save him uh, again, again, and Gein to save the crew. And by the end of it, he still goes back with his Captain and is just, oh, I want to see this man back so very much. You get Saul, then there's Saul, who is Robin's like first friend, and hearing his laugh and his relationship with her mother and there's just so many little moments throughout this series with these small little characters that Oda puts in there to make you love them to make you love this world and that is who Saul is like he he has representations of the will of D but that's not what makes him special it's what it's the moment of kindness that he gave to Robin when she was so sad and without any friends and teaching her to laugh and risking his life to save her to get her back on the water to have a life to live just live Robin I love this man so very much I'm not gonna cry during a list video we're not allowed to cry during a list video uh Iceberg, in general, just him and his crew and Gali La, like, yes, all of them were fantastic. The betrayal I felt with uh, CP9's reveal. Oh, God. Um, Iceberg's relationship to Frankie and to uh, the apprenticing. Oh, God, I, I really loved Iceberg. And then how he turned against Robin, but then revealed that Robin hadn't betrayed the Straw Hats because it all of it, yes, that the entirety of Water 7 are. Um, Crybaby Princess from Fishman Island for no other reason that Luffy calls her Crybaby. And it reminds me of the post-war arc stuff when he was the Crybaby and now he's promising to protect her and keep her safe like a big brother would. And then also the, the octopus Kraken guy, I think he named some version of sushi, which might have been a little insensitive, but still, um, when he says you're only fighting with the bad fishmen people, Hody, because he's threatening uh, your brother. Is it your bigger brother? Is she your older brother or your little brother? Why don't you let me protect them too? I'm gonna cry during this video. Oda makes me cry over these side, very small side characters because they're uh, surrounded and invested by such emotional moments. All right, I'm getting near the end. I can, I can make it without crying. We're going with Nami's mom, her adopted mother, her mother, Bellamere. She is a absolute delight. Give her life for her daughters. Brisk the oceans and being like, I'm going to be their mother. I'm going to raise them. Everyone's saying, no, you can't. She's like, watch me. Yes. Everything about her. Uh, my be beloved uh, love Mihawk because A, awesome, warlord. B, awesome, sword. And C, pulls out the smallest knife he's got and is like, this is all I got. I'm sorry, it's too big for you. I don't use, like, the ultimate weapon to hunt rabbits. And just the insult this man unleashed against Zoro and his pride. And still, like, humbling him. And, but having enough respect to see him as a swordsman and taking him on as an apprentice later on. And then that fight 
like throwing a weapon against Whitebeard. I don't still don't know what the hell that attack was, but and and the respect he had for Whitebeard's crew. I especially love the moment when he was going up against um, their top swordsmen. Just like yes, I know and respect you, and that made me know and respect him because uh, I love Whitebeard so very much. I didn't even mention Shanks in this list. I gotta put Shanks on this list just because of that moment where he walked up and everyone fell as the hockey was released. Um, that moment. I don't need to say it. He has done some awesome things. I love his relationship with Luffy. I love that he's the original Straw Hat owner. Not even the original Straw Hat owner. He was the former Straw Hat owner. Yeah, no, love all that. But no, that moment with everyone just collapsing from his mere presence. That moment. I love Rayleigh, the Dark King. Um, just because he's called the Dark King. That's one of the most awesome nicknames I've ever heard in my life. He's done some really, really cool things. But I love him for that nickname. Uh, I gotta mention Sniper King from Sniper Islands, Location Your Heart, for all the help that he's done. Thank God Usopp called him in. I don't know what we would have done in Water Set, not Water Seven, in Ennis Lobby without him. And uh, finally, the zombie that Luffy had to push back into its own grave because that moment needed to exist because it was hilarious and I loved it so very much. So that is the conclusion of my uh, favorite. Um, non-straw hat characters up until uh Dres Rosa but I also just uploaded the uh Zoe arc uh review so I gotta add some on here because the minx I've already cried about this so them being like no uh Rizo is not here they're hey invading army from Kaido, no, Jack, we're, no, there's no uh, Rizo here, there's no samurai, leave our home alone, and they're like, no, we don't believe you, torturing the, the minx, and everybody just slaughtering their village, and all they can offer them is the same answer, he's not here, he is not here, we have nothing to give you, and at this point, I think Jack believes them, I don't think he honestly believes that there is any samurai on this island, because they've searched, and they're just continuing to torture the minx because I think they're just enjoying it. They're a little sadist. Um, and we see the minx become the victims. How they succumb to the gas. How much they are grateful for the Straw Hats for saving them and being their savior. I, I love that. But we see them go from victim to absolute heroes when uh, Kinemon and uh, Kanjiro uh, return to the island and make their presence known. And how everyone, not just the kings but every single mink come up to them knowing the secret as they drop before them in tears being like samurai of Wano. We welcome you. We've been expecting you. Rizo is safe. They have been holding him and protecting him all that time, taking all that torture to protect him because they wouldn't give up a comrade. Oh, wouldn't give up a friend. Like top of the list. I love them. Like that put the Zoark as like um, number one or two. It is one of my favorite uh, arcs. It is possibly my favorite moment. I need to give it more thought. I love the Minx in general, all of them, because every single one of them knew the truth and not a single one talked. Oh, God almighty. All right, that is the end. I will talk to you later.